Welcome. I'm uh, John Tierman. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for International Studies here, and I, I welcome you on behalf of the Center and also the Iran Study Group at MIT, which has co-sponsored this, uh, to this book talk by Barbara Slavin, who has written this marvelous book, which I've just begun to read myself, Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the U.S., and the Twisted Path to Confrontation, which she has just published, and you will have noticed is for sale right outside, and she will sign some copies after the talk, if you would like. Barbara is the Senior Diplomatic Correspondent, is that the yeah. exact title, of USA Today. She has been so for 11 years. Uh, she has um, many other... Uh, journalistic uh, credits to uh, in her career. She's also been a fellow at the Wilson Center and is now a fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, this is her first book, and I think it's really a marvelous uh, treatment of this very complex relationship. Um, I think particularly marvelous not only because she has done many interviews and really gets it, understands, I think, the relationship, but it's very readable, which many things on this topic are not, um, and very current as well. In preparation for this and, and for her uh, work for USA Today, she's uh, been to Iran six times, has done very extensive interviewing, including, as she describes it, trifecta of Iranian presidents, uh, Rafsanjani, Khatami, and uh, Ahmadinejad. So she comes with a wealth of knowledge and understanding and, um, and accessibility, which uh, is, is very important in being able to explain these things. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Barbara Slavin. <laughs> Just to say one more thing about the format today, we'll have, uh, Barbara will speak for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion, question, and answer. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming out on a cold night. Uh, for someone who has a, just a, a lousy BA from the school up the road, this is very <laughs> impressive. Um, I've been a journalist a long time, uh, over 30 years, and I never thought I would write a book, but this was a book I had to write. I came back from a trip to Iran in the winter of 2006, and I saw that the Bush administration was making the same case for war against Iran that it had made against Iraq. It was talking about weapons of mass destruction, support for terrorism, and human rights abuses. And I became worried, and I also felt that there were things that I knew about the U.S.-Iran relationship that had not been widely publicized, not even by my own newspaper and that it was very important to put those things out there uh, before it was too late. We have an administration in Washington that at least parts of it, I think, want to do the right thing and are looking for some sort of breakthrough with Iran, which would uh, help the United States in enormous ways in that part of, of the region. Uh, but we have other parts of the administration that have not been so uh, supportive of outreach to Iran. And as a result, the policy has been rather uh, confused and, and confusing. Um, I think the way I'll begin is, is with a, uh, an anecdote from, from about a year ago. I uh, learned from my friends in the State Department that Condoleezza Rice uh, was talking about a diplomatic breakthrough with Iran. She was hoping for something like Nixon and Kissinger's successful diplomacy with China in the 1970s. And Rice had offered in uh, a year previously to meet with the Iranians anywhere, anytime, if Iran would suspend its uranium enrichment program. And last spring, I think there was still some optimism in Washington that Iran would accept preconditions and come to talks. Um, of course, that hasn't happened, and tensions between the two countries have gotten much worse because of the nuclear program, Iran's behavior in Iraq, and support for groups that the United States uh, regards as terrorists. And I think the, the chances of a breakthrough right now don't look very good. Um, there's plenty of blame to go around. Certainly, Iran is to be blamed for many of its actions and its rhetoric. But I argue in my book that contradictory and short-sighted policies by the Bush administration 
undercut a series of opportunities to improve relations between the two countries uh, at a time in particular when Iran was in a less uh, strong position in the region and uh, the United States had more cards to play. Now, this is a knowledgeable audience, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the basics of the U.S.-Iran relationship. You know that in 1953, the U.S. CIA overthrew a very popular prime minister in Iran who had nationalized the oil industry there. You know that the United States put back on the throne the Shah of Iran, uh, who was then overthrown in the 1979 revolution. You know about the hostage crisis that Iranian revolutionaries seized uh, for, uh, 52 Americans and held them hostage for 444 days. Um, Iran has been a very difficult country for the United States to deal with for some time. In my book, I compare the, uh, Iran to the old comedian Rodney Dangerfield, who could never get enough respect. Um, Iran has a chip on its shoulder when it comes to the United States, and, and I think for good reason. Uh, still, Iran progressed in the last few years uh, to a point where there actually were many people there who were ready to open a dialogue with the United States. And the tragedy is that once Iran was ready, the Bush administration, the United States was not. I won't go all the way back in history. Uh, there are plenty of books, excellent books, that look at the last hundred years of U.S.-Iran relations. But I'll focus on the, the part that I really got to cover. Uh, I joined USA Today in 1996, and I made my first trip to Iran in 1996. And I, I think I've been in a very privileged position to cover both sides of the story. To go to Iran and examine the attitudes there, then come back to the United States and see what governments in Washington wanted to do, what their foreign policy was, and then back again to see the effect and so on, sort of like a ping pong ball. Uh, for the purposes of the book, I start in, in great detail with the administration of uh, the first President Bush. Uh, I interviewed Brent Scowcroft, who was the national security advisor for the first President Bush. And uh, he surprised me. He told me that that administration was very open to improving relations with Iran. Uh, the Iranians had uh, engineered the release of the last U.S. hostages in Lebanon. These were people who were held by uh, groups in Lebanon that were very pro-Iranian, financed by Iran. And this President Bush said in his inaugural, inaugural address that goodwill begets goodwill. So. Various emissaries started coming forward, uh, coming to Washington, passing messages that the Iranians wanted to open a formal dialogue. And Brent Scowcroft uh, and the first President Bush were very amenable to this. Uh, Scowcroft told me that he told these emissaries, quote, we're happy to do it. We could have it official, public, or private citizen to private citizen, any way you want it. He said that the two countries actually went so far as agreeing to have a formal meeting in Switzerland in 1990. But at the last minute, uh, the Iranians got cold feet. And Scowcroft uh, concluded that the regime wasn't ready, that uh, it didn't feel secure enough to open a formal dialogue with the United States. Then the Clinton administration came in, and they had a tougher approach, which they called dual containment. This was isolation and sanctions against both Iran and Iraq. And the White House uh, in 1995 put a total embargo on US trade with Iran and investment in the oil industry. Up until then, actually, U.S. oil companies had been lifting Iranian oil and selling it in Europe and uh, selling more Iranian oil than, any other, uh, than companies from any other country. But uh, Clinton put this embargo on. Um, he also signed into law something called the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which threatened uh, sanctions against foreign companies that invested in Iran's oil uh, uh, sector. Um, so. Relations hit a, a new low, I would argue, at least at the beginning of the, uh, of the Clinton administration. Uh, but then something happened in 1997, uh, something unexpected. Iran had presidential elections, and a man named Mohammad Hatami was elected president. He was a, a surprise victor, uh, a cleric, very soft-spoken, somebody who spoke German and uh, some English, um, someone who had a very different attitude toward the United States than those who preceded him. He gave an interview to Christian Amanpour of CNN and as soon as he took office where he talked about a dialogue of civilizations with the United States to break down the wall of mistrust between the two countries. And Clinton was intrigued. He embraced this overture. Uh, and he encouraged uh, exchanges of all sorts to, to begin with Iran. I was lucky enough to be in Tehran in 1998 when American wrestlers came. This was the first delegation of American athletes to go to Iran since the 1979 revolution. 
And uh, I remember sitting in the stadium. Uh, the Iranians were so thrilled to have the Americans there that they cheered for the Americans even more than they did for the Iranian wrestlers. It was extraordinary. And uh, they had flags flying of all the countries participating. And the American flag was flying. It was the first time the flag had flown in Iran in public since the revolution when it wasn't being burned in an anti-American demonstration. Um, it, was, it was great. Clinton followed up on this pin down diplomacy by sending more messages to Iran. He sent uh, then Vice President Al Gore to Saudi Arabia with a message for the Iranians. Uh, Gore told then Crown Prince Abdullah that the U.S. did want to set up a formal dialogue. And Clinton even named uh, three individuals who would represent the United States in these talks. Bruce Rydell, who was a senior official on the National Security Council, the, under, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, Thomas Pickering, and David Welch, who was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, responsible for that part of the world at that time. But just as under the first Bush administration, there was no reply from, from Iran. Uh, Clinton didn't give up. He sent a letter to President Hatami uh, asking for Iranian cooperation in resolving the, uh, an act of terrorism uh, against Americans that took place in Kobar Towers. This was a, a barracks for American Air Force personnel in Saudi Arabia. Nineteen of them were killed in a terrorist bombing in 1996. And there were reliable reports that Iran had uh, given support to the Saudis who carried out this act of terrorism. So Clinton sent a letter. Um, and this time there was a reply, Hatami replied, uh, but his reply was that Iran was not involved. Iran condemned terrorism and so sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you. Um, still, the Clinton administration went forward. It slightly eased the sanctions that it had imposed on Iran uh, for food and medicine and carpets. Um, and then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright gave a major speech in uh, March 2000 in which she for the first time apologized for the 1953 coup by the CIA, and she also apologized for the fact that the United States had supported Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, this was a war that went on for eight years, and more than a quarter of a million Iranians died in this war. Uh, so uh, huge grievance on, on Iran's side. But Albright made a mistake. I think it was a, a, a fatal one, and it's one that the Bush administration, this Bush administration, has continued and has compounded. She sought to distinguish between Hatami and his cabinet and the supreme leader of Iran, a cleric named Ali Khamenei, and his appointees. Uh, she called the latter group unelected hands. Uh, and this was a major mistake. I mean, there's a reason why he's called the supreme leader. Ali Khamenei is the ultimate decision maker in Iran. And the president under the Iranian political system is subordinate to him. Therefore, there was no way that Hatami could uh, could put into effect a major st strategic realignment for Iran without the support of the Supreme Leader, and you don't get that support by insulting him. Um, still, I would argue that by the end of the Clinton administration, relations were uh, in a warming trend. They were much better than they had been at any time, certainly in the past 30 years. You even had Iranian parliamentarians who, who uh, came to New York and went to a reception at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, Hatami came repeatedly to the UN, and there were many exchanges uh, back and forth, as, as John Tierman knows quite well. Then we come to, to this Bush administration. Uh, it's ironic to remember that uh, Iranian officials actually root, rooted for George W. Bush to be elected. They remembered his father fondly, and they thought that uh, George Bush and Dick Cheney as oil men would be much more predisposed to uh, reestablishing relations with Iran than Al Gore, who they thought was much more beholden to pro-Israel voters in the United States. And from the Iranian point of view, there were a few promising signs at the beginning of the, this Bush administration. Uh, Richard Haas, who was a senior official uh, in the administration, lobbied to uh, extend the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act by only two years instead of the full five years. And this was supposed to be meant as a signal to Iran that the U.S. was interested in improving relations. Unfortunately, the Republican-led Congress, in, uh, in its zeal to prove how anti-Iranian they could be, uh, extended the, this uh, sanctions legislation by the full five years. Then we come to September 11th. And this, to my mind, was the moment of strategic opportunity for the Bush administration to really, re, uh, to really change the geopolitical map in the Middle East, to 
make friends out of foes, to focus on one enemy, Al-Qaeda. Uh, but of course, as we know, Bush did not uh, focus just on Al-Qaeda. Still, initially, the, the effort was to overthrow the Taliban, which had hosted Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And Iran was a willing partner. Uh, there were spontaneous demonstrations, candlelit demonstrations, in the streets of Tehran after September 11th uh, by Iranians who uh, came out in sympathy with the United States. Uh, there were not demonstrations like this in any other Muslim country that I know of, certainly not in Arab countries, including countries that, that are allied with the United States. And President Hatemi came to the UN General Assembly for a delayed meeting of the General Assembly in November 2001. And he let an American diplomat know that he was going to be bringing a large, an unusually large delegation with him, uh, including uh, experts, intelligence experts on, uh, on Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, and he also asked permission to visit Ground Zero to pay his respects to the victims of 9-11. But the State Department did not push on either of these requests, and I think that was the first big opportunity for better relations between Bush and Iran uh, that, that was lost at that time. Still, the Iranians persisted. Uh, they uh, supported the effort to overthrow the Taliban militarily. They actually had uh, commanders of the Quds Force, you may have heard this term, this is the, Re the Jerusalem Force, an elite unit within the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and they were present on the ground in Kabul when uh, that city fell uh, in uh, November 2001. The Iranians had supported a group called the Northern Alliance, an Afghan group, uh, for years, uh, much longer than the United States had, uh, and so they they helped, they actually, I had Iranians tell me that they tried to provide, provide targeting information to the U U.S. Air Force via the Northern Alliance. Um, and they complained that the Pakistanis were giving false targeting information, which was actually uh, hurting the Northern Alliance, sometimes bombing them instead of the Taliban. And the Iranians were very supportive on the diplomatic front as well. Uh, they uh, helped put in place the government of Hamid Karzai. It was a, an Iranian diplomat who actually suggested that the uh, document that was, was uh, put together forming this first provisional Afghan government uh, recognized the importance of democracy and human rights. This was an Iranian suggestion, not an American one. I interviewed a, uh, an Iranian who was very involved in this diplomacy, and he explained to me why uh, Iran was so helpful at that time. He said, quote, the general impression was that this was a national tragedy for the United States and success in addressing that tragedy was extremely important for the U.S. public in general and the administration in particular. There wasn't another moment in U.S. history when there was more of a psychological need for success on the U.S. part. That is why we consciously decided not to qualify our cooperation on Afghanistan or make it contingent upon a change in U.S. policy, believing erroneously that the impact would be of such magnitude that it would automatically have altered the nature of, of Iran-U.S. relations. Um, this Iranian cooperation with the United States was very popular in, in Tehran and Iran generally. I visited Iran in December 2001 and I was struck that Iranians uh, from all walks of life, once they found out I was an American, would come up to me and they would express sympathy for 9-11 and their admiration for the United States. But what was more remarkable was that politicians would openly, on the record, say that now was the time for the United States and Iran to restore relations. This was not something I had heard on previous trips to, to Iran. What I didn't know at the time and only found out about in 2003 was that there actually was some uh, formal diplomatic movement. There were talks, uh, direct uh, talks, just between U.S. and Iranian diplomats that began in the fall of 2001 and went all the way through May 2003. Uh, these talks took place in Europe. Uh, in Paris and Geneva, and uh, the cover for it was that they were all about Afghanistan, and initially they, they were about Afghanistan, but uh, they moved on to other issues such as Al-Qaeda, what to do about Al-Qaeda detainees who were fleeing Afghanistan uh, via Iran, and the Iranians actually, uh, they, they were presented by the Americans with lists of some of these Al-Qaeda figures, and many of them, scores of them, they arrested and they deported. Uh, some of them they couldn't find, some of them they held on to uh, as, as bargaining chips, I would argue, uh, for, for uh, a future deal. Um, talks also uh, took place on Iraq. The Iranians actually warned the United States what they might face if they overthrew Saddam Hussein. Um, unfortunately, the Bush administration was, uh, 
was not listening or perhaps did not trust what the Iranians were, were telling them. Um, these were practical talks. They weren't talks about some grand bargain. Uh, but as they progressed, I think the Iranians got more confident. And in May of 2003, there actually was a, an extraordinary offer for talks that was presented by the Iranians. Uh, it was so extraordinary that I've put it in the annex to my book. This was something that was written by the then Iranian ambassador to France, Sadek Karazi. Uh, it was uh, edited by Javad Zarif, who was a deputy foreign minister, later became Iran's ambassador to the United Nations. And the, the version I have in my book is actually uh, the version that Javad Zarif edited. And it shows the final edits that he put in it. And then it was transmitted by the Swiss, who represent US interests in Iran in the absence of diplomatic relations with it. Uh, it, it landed in Washington in early May 2003, and it was extraordinary. It had all the issues that were of concern to both countries, uh, an agenda for talks. Uh, Iran agreed to talk about its nuclear program, which was then, of course, not in such an advanced stage. Uh, Iran's support for groups that the United States considers terrorist, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran's uh, refusal to recognize Israel, uh, it, Iran agreed to talk about a two-state solution. There was then an Arab League proposal for a two-state solution. All these issues were there. And on the U.S. side, the U.S. was to talk about economic sanctions, U.S. Uh, uh, links with a group that Iran regards as terrorist. It's a group called the Mujahideen Hulk. Uh, all the issues that Iran was concerned about as well. So it landed, and uh, there was some enthusiastic reception on the part of some lower level and mid-level State Department uh, officials, but uh, it got no traction in Washington. Condoleezza Rice, who was then the National Security Advisor, says that she never even saw the offer, which I frankly find very hard to believe, uh, since it definitely went to the National Security Council. She says she doesn't remember seeing it. So perhaps she did, but she just doesn't remember seeing it. Um, the Bush administration didn't even reply. Uh, this was May 2003. We had mission accomplished, as you recall, in Iraq, according to President Bush. And uh, the attitude of the administration was that uh, Iraq was a huge success. It was going to be uh, a, a democratic exemplar in the region. And uh, Iran might, or Syria might be next. And there was absolutely no need to sit down and negotiate with the Iranians at this time. So you know, one can think now. Uh, what would have happened had that proposal been taken up. Iran had no centrifuges spinning at that time. Uh, uh, President Hatemi was still there, not Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And uh, of course, the US position in Iraq was a lot more favorable than, than it is today. At the same time, these talks in Europe that I mentioned uh, also ended. I, I, I did what journalists are supposed to do, although I feel guilty about it. I, I heard about them, and I did a front page story in USA Today about the talks. I said they, they, were, they were the kind of authoritative, high-level talks that the Clinton administration dreamed of. And here they were happening under the Bush administration, which had put Iran on the axis of evil, as you might remember in a 2002 speech by President Bush. Um, when this story broke, uh, I remember I was traveling with, Col with uh, Colin Powell at the time. We were in, in the Middle East. And I remember watching her on CNN. She looked so embarrassed. I think there were parts of the administration that didn't know these talks were going on. They had been kept secret, and the uh, uh, American diplomats I talked to said they were so, the administration was so worried about leaks that they were not even allowed to keep notes um, for fear that it would indeed leak. So the administration shut these talks down. They, they had a pretext. There were bombings in Saudi Arabia by Al Qaeda. And the administration claimed that there were links uh, somehow to al-Qaeda detainees in Iran. They produced no proof for this, and it's my firm belief that this was simply a pretext to end these embarrassing talks with evil uh, now that they had been caught and because they were feeling in such a, a triumphant mood. There were other opportunities as well, and these came, believe it or not, even after the 2005 election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, he had a new national security advisor, someone who was actually a rival of his in these elections, a man named Ali Larijani, who I think wants to be the Henry Kissinger of, of Iran. Um, I interviewed him in uh, the winter of 2006, and uh, I had heard that he had done his doctoral dissertation on the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. So I thought I would ask him you know, what American thinkers, past or present, he admired. 
And uh, so I, I posed the question, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, well, American thinkers, he said, I admire Mr. Headley, he said. And I said, Headley? Who is Mr. Headley? And he said it again, and I said, Headley, do you mean Hadley, Stephen Hadley, our national security advisor? And he said, yes, he said, Stephen Hadley is a logical thinker. Those of you in the audience who are of Iranian extraction may know the word taruf. Yes, this is Persian flattery. But it was an overture. It was clearly an overture to Steve Hadley. And he went further. He authorized one of his deputies, a man named Mohammed Javad Jafari, to open a back channel to Steve Hadley or a designated emissary of Steve Hadley. And the offer was, you know, again, we'll meet with you anywhere in Europe, in New York, in you know, Tehran, wherever you like. Um, so this offer I dutifully transmitted back to Mr. Hadley. And uh, I think he was interested in it. But once again, no response. So weeks went by, and uh, Larry Johnny then decided he would go public. He publicly embraced a prior US offer for talks just about Iraq. This was an offer that Condoleezza Rice had put on the table in the fall of 2005. And even more extraordinary, uh, Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader himself, a week after Larry Johnny spoke, also publicly endorsed U.S.-Iran talks about Iraq. And you have to remember that prior to this, uh, anyone who publicly advocated such talks would have been charged with treason and thrown in jail. Uh, Larry, uh, Hanane had repeatedly criticized those who had openly called for talks. Uh, and this time he was endorsing it. But guess what? Once again, the United States did not reply, even though this was the Bush administration's own idea. Uh, it was worried that uh, the Iraqis, particularly the Sunnis in Iraq, would think that the U.S. and Iran were, were uh, trying to form a new government for Iraq over the heads of the Iraqis. At this time, Iraq had had elections, but it had a caretaker government. They were squabbling over who to name. And also, the Bush administration was afraid that somehow this would interfere with its campaign against Iran's nuclear program, which was accelerating at the time. Once again, Nothing was done, and, and I think it, it had domestic consequences. It humiliated Larry Johnny, it undermined him, and it strengthened Ahmadinejad, who was much more belligerent, much more aggressive. And I would argue that Larry Johnny was never that strong after that, and you know that just a couple of weeks ago, he actually resigned as Iran's chief nuclear negotiator. Had the United States taken up that offer then, it would have empowered Larry Johnny, uh, and he perhaps would have, he obviously had the support of the Supreme Leader, uh, many, many Iranians have told me that the Supreme Leader was much closer to Larry Jani, frankly, than he was to Ahmadinejad, but that opportunity was lost. Um, Condoleezza Rice did come out in May of uh, 2006, and she did offer to join negotiations with Iran that had been conducted by European countries, uh, but there was a condition. Iran had to suspend your, its uranium enrichment program before it would do so. And of course, these would be multilateral talks. They would not be direct one-on-one -on -one talks, which is what Iran had been seeking. Um, so Rice may compare herself to, to Nixon and, and Kissinger and think that somehow you know, she can uh, facilitate a strategic breakthrough with Iran. Um, but the policies that she has advocated and the conditions that she has placed on, on this dialogue thank you very much, <laughs> turning that off, um, have, have undercut the chances for a real breakthrough. I think that, that Nixon and Kissinger had a, a, a very clear strategic vision of how they wanted to change the geopolitical map, how they were going to recognize China and play China off against the Soviet Union and vice versa, and also take attention away from uh, the U.S. debacle in, in another war in, in, in Vietnam. But, you know, Bush has been unable to prioritize uh, his goals. Uh, he wants to stem nuclear proliferation on the one hand, but he also wants to promote democracy. And we've seen that even when Condi Rice was talking about negotiations and talking about uh, potential breakthroughs, Bush was calling for the Iranian people to rise up and overthrow the regime. You know, he had a line in his 2005 uh, inaugural, as you stand for your liberty, we stand with you. And of course, the uh, Congress has appropriated funds for quote unquote democracy promotion, which Iran regards as support for uh, regime change. Um, there have also been intensifying sanctions, uh, unilateral US sanctions and also through the UN Security Council. 
Uh, the administration has succeeded in, in pushing these through. Uh, there have been two sanctions resolutions. They're looking for a third. And there have been sanctions against Iranian banks, which I think have had more of an effect, have made it very difficult for Iranians to do business, have, uh, have been supported to some extent by the Europeans as well. And uh, when combined with economic mismanagement by Iran's own president, Ahmadinejad, have had a, a, quite a stunning impact, I think, on the uh, on the Iranian economy, despite the fact that oil is now at, at, at absolutely record prices. Um, at the same time, uh, Iran has strengthened its, its position regionally through its support for Shia groups in Iraq. Uh, it's also doing rather well in Lebanon, where Hezbollah, which is another Iranian client, is stronger than it's ever been. And just uh, last summer, Hamas, which is another Iranian client, uh, took over half of Palestine. So I would argue that the U.S is in, in a much worse position, and uh, we're in a position of, of offering uh, too little, too late. There was a, a New York Times uh, column by David Brooks the other day. I don't know how many of you read it, but I thought it was quite good. It was about how Condoleezza Rice is organizing a peace conference in, uh, for the Middle East uh, at the end of this month, and that it's really about uh, confronting Iran more than it is about Arab-Israeli peace. And he said she was going from place to place and putting together what he called a coalition of the losing and indeed, wherever you look, uh, U.S. clients and, and allies are in a, in a worse position than they were, uh, were before. Um, I was in uh, New York in September when Ahmadinejad came for his third visit to the U.N. General Assembly. And I asked one of his top officials who was accompanying him, you know, why don't you accept Condoleezza Rice's offer? She keeps saying that she'll meet with you anywhere, any place, if you will just suspend that uranium enrichment program for, you know, a few weeks, a few months. And this official said, quote, we think Rice is lying, unquote. We do not believe that this administration is interested in improving relations with Iran. We think this is all uh, a ruse in order to solidify international opinion against Iran, in order to impose more sanctions, and ultimately to, to get rid of our regime. I'm not sure, frankly, that there's anything that this administration can do in its waning months to change that impression. I think uh, impressions on both sides have hardened, um, and that uh, Iran is uh, clearly and has clearly intensified its uranium enrichment program. It now has 3,000 centrifuges spinning away, uh, perhaps not terribly efficiently, but they, they've gotten much farther ahead than they were uh, before. Um, and uh, I think that you know this is a stalemate that's going to persist. We can talk a little bit in the Q&A about the prospects for military action. President Bush has made some rather bellicose comments, although he toned them down a little bit this week. And of course, Vice President Cheney has done the same. And meanwhile, in Tehran, Ahmadinejad is beating his breast and talking about those centrifuges spinning. Uh, so we're in a, a difficult position. And I think that at least for the foreseeable future, the US and Iran are going to remain what I call bitter friends and bosom enemies. And with that, I will be happy to take your questions. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I think we'll use the mic for questions because this is being uh, taped and will be on the uh, CIS website eventually um, and MIT World, I guess. The um, just one, uh, two, two sort of program notes. One is uh, for your questions. Welcome to make comments, but of course uh, keep them within reasonable length. Um, and second, I just wanted to remind everyone of a couple of upcoming events is somewhat related to these uh, topics. Uh, one is uh, next week, Yost Tilderman of the International Crisis Group. He's the head of their Middle East office in Amman. Um, and he has come out with a book recently about uh, the use of chemical weapons in Iraq, by Iraq, against uh, the Kurdish people and against Iran uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, that will be in this building at 4.30 next Thursday. And then on December 10th, Juan Cole will be here, um, perhaps the most uh, respected blogger of uh, uh, all topics Middle East. He'll be talking about Iraq on December 10th. And you can look at our calendar um, for information about where and when that will be held. So um, let's have questions. If you would, uh, I'll... I'll Work the mic around so you can so 
so your, your words will be preserved in history. Um, would anybody like to start? Yeah, thank you very much for that fascinating book. Can you tell us a little bit um, about your reporting projects that are, um, and you, you, you said you've been there seven times. Six. Six. Yeah. Um, what are the conditions um, mm -hmm. under which you travel there? Um, how uh, are your interactions with the Iranians, ordinary and official? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about getting out that that Iran, because the Iran is mm -hmm. a huge country. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it, it's an easier country for, that it has been an easier country for me to work in than a lot of other places I've been. Um, uh, the government uh, does try to keep tabs to some extent, but uh, I have, you know, over time I made a lot of friends and they would, you know, come and pick me up at my hotel and nobody, I don't think, was following me at that point. I was careful not to use the hotel telephone to make appointments with people. Um, and you could, you know, just pick up a cab on the street too when you wanted to go go somewhere. Whenever I went for my official appointments, I always took my driver with me, knowing full well that he would, you know, report on me. But they could tell from my stories who I was speaking to anyway. Um, I've, I've found Iranians in general very open, uh, and this is in Tehran and outside Tehran, uh, not always willing to have their names used, but sometimes yes. And uh, much more candid and forthcoming than, than people in a lot of countries in the Middle East. Um, I haven't traveled as much as I would, would have liked, but um, I have been to Isfahan, which is uh, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, I uh, went to a place called Abiyane, which is a little jewel of, a, of a, an antique village that's actually on, I think, the UNESCO list of world heritage places. Uh, uh, I drove by Natanz, where the infamous uranium enrichment plant is, and uh, also went to uh, Kashan uh, and took sort of a, a long, just I drove all the way, you know, through these beautiful mountains for hours and hours. It's, I've been to Qum also several times. This is the theological uh, center. Uh, so I think I've gotten a taste. I, I still desperately need to go to Shiraz, and I know that I have not truly seen Iran until I see Shiraz. I've been told this many times. And I also want to get to, to Mashhad and the Caspians. So inshallah in the future, uh, trip, I, I will get there. But I think that, you know, over the course of these trips and given the numbers of people that I met, I also, oh, I f I'm sorry, I also went to Gansar and Aradan. This is, Aradan is the uh, home village of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and this is way out in the sticks, uh, east of, uh, uh, east of Tehran on the old Silk Road, you know, through the desert to, to China, and that really is in the middle of nowhere. So I got, got a chance to sample opinion there. And then in Tehran, I would always go to, uh, to the poor areas, to South Tehran, uh, not just stay where the, the wealthy, you know, congregate. And uh, I also went to Narmak, which is a middle class, lower middle class neighborhood where uh, Ahmadinejad uh, spent much of his childhood and, uh, and adulthood. So, you know, it, for, look, for an American, American, it's not bad. And I think what, what made it unique was not so much the Iran experience was watching that sort of ricochet off the U.S. policy because particularly under the Clinton administration, although to some extent under Bush as well, I would come back and uh, American officials would be eager to talk to me because they don't get to go. So, you know, we could talk and I could share my impressions and then I would, could get a sense of, of, of how they were uh, reacting to, to Iran's uh, policies, which was, I think, very useful. The seat's down here if you'd like to come and sit there at other places. Mm -hmm. uh, question about uh, the change of attitude that happened between, uh, say, October, November 2001 mm -hmm. and January of 2002, where we all shocked yes. at the fact that from very close cooperation between the U.S anyone over the issue of Taliban in Afghanistan, we went to the axis of evil. Axis of evil, yeah. Now, for observers, this was short. I think, uh, personally, that the policy of the U.S. was uh, somehow changed beyond the interest of the U.S. 
Mm. <laughs> I know where you're going, so let me let me explain the yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't in my formal talk explain what happened with the axis of evil, um, but there were two things. Um, first, there were Al Qaeda uh, members who were fleeing Afghanistan through Iran, and uh, there although the Iranians did arrest and uh, and extradite some of them to their home countries, some of them they held on to and. The Bush administration was very angry about this. This was, this was number one. But the real factor, this is what did it. In uh, January of 2002, uh, the Israelis intercepted uh, a ship uh, that had um, weapons from Iran, allegedly, that were bound for uh, Yasser Arafat and the Palestine Liberation Organization. This, was, of course, was still during the, the Palestinian Intifada. And I think that was the turning point. Uh, it was the turning point actually on two levels. Bush wrote off Arafat after that and decided he would have nothing to do with him. Um, and he decided then to put uh, Iran on the axis of evil. One of his speechwriters had come up with this idea of an axis. Uh, and another speechwriter came up with of evil. And then Bush uh, and, and, and his advisors decided that the members would be, they needed three. So Saddam Hussein's Iraq was easy, and North Korea was easy, and they needed a third, and there was Iran just sitting there. Um, so that's, that's what they did. And one of the, the more shocking things, actually, in reporting this book, I had a long interview with Condi Rice, who I've traveled with and covered over the last few years. And I asked her, I said, Madam Secretary, did you, did you know that this would, what impact this would have on Iran, that it would be uh, embarrassing and humiliating to people who had gone out on a limb and said that they wanted relations with the U.S.? And Rice said to me, quote, I did not even know what effect it would have in the United States. She didn't think that this phrase was going to be picked up by anyone. She thought, she said, she had gone to brief the White House reporters and she thought what they were going to pick up on was that the Bush administration was now going to promote democracy in the Middle East. That was what she was pushing. So she didn't even know. And of course, as you know, um, it had a very uh, bad effect in Iran uh, on those politicians I mentioned who had been so bold as to come out and advocate relations with the U.S. were embarrassed and humiliated. Uh, Hatami was, was, was hurt by it. And uh, the Iranians, uh, they, they took it. The, these talks that I mentioned that took place in Geneva and Paris, they, the Iranians suspended one session. The February 2002 session was suspended to show that they were very angry about the axis of evil. But, you know, they call us the great Satan and global arrogance and all these other things, so they actually did, did resume them. But, but it was damaging. And uh, still, I mean, the most damaging thing, frankly, was the decision to end those direct talks and not to begin the formal negotiations in the spring of 2003. That, that was by far the most. When you say, is there another agenda here? You know, look, okay, the Bush administration is a very strong supporter of Israel. Ariel Sharon was the prime minister then. Uh, would another uh, administ U.S. administration have used that phrase? Probably not. Uh, this is George Bush. He loves to see things in black and white. And uh, again, you know, his, his problem, and, and this has certainly become clear in the last few years, is that he didn't just focus on al-Qaeda. He wanted to take on all terrorists, all terrorist organizations. So it became terrorism, all terrorism of global reach. So not just al-Qaeda, but Hezbollah, Hamas. You name it. And, and once he did that, he really lost the opportunity to, to build bridges uh, to Iran, Syria, countries that could provide enormous help in terms of focusing just on al-Qaeda. To this day, Iran has a son of Osama bin Laden under uh, hotel arrest in Iran. And there are a couple of other senior al-Qaeda figures who are being held. They're, the Iranians were ready to trade them uh, for members of the Mujahideen Hulk, which is a, an Iranian dissident group. It's actually on the U.S. terrorism list. And there are 3,000 members of this group under U.S. protection in Iraq. And in 2003, May of 2003, the Iranians pushed for a swap. U.S. wouldn't swap. So, okay, it's more important to protect the Mujahideen Hulk than to get Osama bin Laden's son. Fine. You know, that was a decision the Bush administration made. And uh, it was the subject of some contention within the administration, and the book deals a lot with the internal disputes. You know, um, the State Department, Colin Powell, wanted very much to to try to improve relations with Iran, but he was blocked by 
Vice President Cheney and by the Defense Department, by Don Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz and, and Doug Fife and people like that. So that's where that stood. While I walk this up here, I want to remind you that uh, there's not only refreshments outside, but books for sale. Please keep that in mind. Yes, you said your book, you began your book with the Bush administration. With the first Bush administration, first Bush administration. yeah. I'm curious, why didn't you start your book during the 1970s, when, when, America, when, the whole, when this whole situation mm -hmm. of aggression began by America betraying Iran by supporting by supporting Khomeini and Khomeini and all the other dissident groups in Iran just because America was afraid that Iran would rise with its place America as the dominant power in the Persian Gulf after the British had left during the 60s and 70s. And right now, now you, and also it's come can I, can I stop you? Can I stop you there because your history is a little no, funny? I'm actually very accurate and I did hear you think around several minutes about Iranian history in your opening. And one, my, question, my main question is not only do you feel that America created the situation by, support, by supporting the Islamic regime, which turned against America, but also do you feel that, that America is pursuing diplomatic negotiations because at present America no longer has the capability to launch a successful invasion of Iran? Well, these are, these are two questions. Um, in terms of supporting Khomeini, not that I remember, <laughs> uh, the United States supported the Shah. Uh, you know, until until the bitter end, and even uh, you know allowed him to come to this country for medical treatment when he was dying of cancer. That was what what sparked the uh, the takeover of the American embassy and the seizure of American hostages. So, the Shah had been a, an ally of the United States, and Jimmy Carter uh, was as loyal as he could be to the Shah to the to the bitter end. Um, so I'm afraid your 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 history there is is incorrect. Well, it, it, let me finish, if you don't mind. You've 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 had your you've you've had your 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 say, uh, and and the reason I don't deal with that in great detail is because there are many wonderful wonderful books about that period. Um, some of which I mention in in my uh, bibliography. The Reign of the Ayatollahs by Shal Bakash. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful book also, uh, The Lion and the Eagle, I believe it's called by James Bill. So there are many fine books about that period, and that's why I. I, I focus on the part that I personally covered in, in detail. I think that, that's more valuable. In terms of, of, of uh, why the U.S. is opting for diplomacy now, um, you do have a point, which is that, that you know, although there is all this bellicose rhetoric, and, and although uh, in my book I quote some folks as saying that the chances of a U.S. attack on Iran are about 20% before Bush leaves office, 2 out of 10 is the way it's been put to me. I still tend not to believe it. I think because of Iraq uh, and because of the, the situation we're in there, the U.S. simply is not in a position to attack a third Muslim country. And uh, the Iranians also are in, a, in an extremely good position to retaliate for an attack like that through its, uh, its supporters, its proxies in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Palestine. And the Iranians might even do something which they've never done, unlike al-Qaeda, which is uh, commit an act of terrorism against Americans in our homeland. So I think uh, Bush is thinking once, twice, three times, and it's my profound hope that he would not do anything like that, which would be, uh, would be a disaster, in, in my view. First of all, I want to thank you for writing the book. We need about 20 more books like this because <laughs> Americans have no clue what's going on over there. Um, just a, a quick thing about the Shia Crescent that you mentioned. Um, I, I kind of believe that there seems to be almost a conspiracy between um, the Sunni-dominated countries of the region against Iran, and I think um, countries like Saudi Arabia have a lot of influence on how America mm -hmm. and Iran relate to each other. And I just want to know what you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole idea for a Middle East peace conference came because uh, the administration was desperate for a strategy to confront Iran. And one of the most potent uh, propaganda arguments that Ahmadinejad uses, of course, is that you know Iran is more pro-Palestinian than the Arabs, than the Arab regimes. He's always talking about uh, the Palestinians. He wears a kafia draped around him, uh, and uh, he, 
talks about the Holocaust, denies the Holocaust, says Israel should be wiped off the map. I have to tell you, this language is not very popular within Iran. Uh, Iranians, in my experience, are, uh, could care less, frankly, about the Palestinian cause. I mean, they're sympathetic with Palestinians, but not to the extent that they like having hundreds of millions of dollars in their oil revenues uh, uh, spent on, on Palestinians. And in fact, in my experience, they're much more uh, anti-Arab than they are uh, anti-Jewish, because Jews have lived in Iran for thousands of years, uh, whereas the Arabs are considered to be uh, nouveau riche, uh, you know, Bedouins, uh, low culture, uh, inferior in every way to the superior Persians. Uh, so it's kind of a joke that you know people think that, that Iran is so anti-Israel and, and pro-Palestinian. In, in fact, it's not. Uh, certainly in terms of the, the ordinary people, it is in terms of its official uh, policy. But I mentioned this coalition of the losing <laughs> that, that Condi is organizing as she goes roaming around the Middle East from the, the GCC countries of the Gulf to, to uh, uh, Egypt and Jordan and, um, you know, the rallying cry really is uh, to contain Iran and to prevent those uppity Shia from taking too much uh, power in countries where uh, they're uh, an important minority or even where they're a majority. Uh, for example, in Bahrain, they're more Shia than Sunni, but they're run by a Sunni government. You have Shia in Kuwait, you have Shia in United Arab Emirates, Oman, um, Iraq, of course, they have uh, taken control of much of the country now. Uh, so uh, eastern Saudi Arabia, where the oil is. So the uh, the Arab regimes are really quite frightened of this resurgent Iran. Just that one first. I, I don't, you know, I, I meant this book, I mean, although there's a great deal in it, I think, for specialists who, who follow the, this in, in quite close detail, uh, I meant this to be a book for the, the general audience, and so I don't, you know, go quite that far down in, in the weeds uh, to, to this particular group. Um, but I do talk about, um, I do talk about certainly Cheney and John Bolton and Paul Wolfowitz and Doug Fife. Uh, you know, and uh, and those uh, who saw removing Saddam Hussein as a kind of jumping off point to go after the Syrian regime and, and especially the Iranian regime, um, I do mention them, but I don't I don't go into the project for the New American Century. The second question is, how much of these books that are written about Iran do you think are written by people like ourselves here that don't really represent the real Iranians? There are people like yourself that go to Iran. Intermittently, you meet middle-class Iranians. You know, those are the people who would love to come to no, the West. Poor, poor people too. A lot of um, poor people. No, I know. But generally speaking, you know, the means of communications are through English-speaking people. People are relatively well off. One can connect with. How much of that is really the true Iranian? You know, I'm not trying to deny what I haven't read your book yet. Okay. But um, well, I'm not trying to deny what's in your book. But I'm just yeah. saying that you often see the same. You know, the intellectual groups go back and forth and write about Iran and don't really... I, I, tried, I, tried very, yeah. I tried very hard not to do that. Um, uh, you know, look, obviously one has limited time and limited resources, and, and my friends in Iran are clearly of the sort that you, you would mention, my close friends there. But no, I, I did the best I could to talk to ordinary people, and there are a lot of, I think, rather funny anecdotes about some of the things, and also some poignant anecdotes about some of the things that, that, that people have, uh, have said to me there that I think do show... Uh, you know, the ambivalence that Iranians feel about the United States, because I don't think it's, it's the reason I called it bitter friends, bosom enemies, it's not just the officials, it's also the people who have a kind of love-hate relationship with the United States. Uh, they're tremendously proud, and proud of their own country and what they've managed to do despite American sanctions and pressures and all the rest. Uh, yet at the same time, you know, the Iranian diaspora now is huge. There are almost a million Iranian Americans just, uh, just now in this country. And people go back and forth, and, and they watch television, they watch satellite TV, even in the poor households. They watch American 
uh, sitcoms and old movies and, and uh, they surf the internet and they have an awareness of, of the states and aspects of the states uh, that I think is, is, is fairly good. Even in places like Gomsar and Aradan, you know, uh, you find people who have some sense of the United States. So I, I've done the best I can not to just talk about the intelligentsia. I've also included some polls, very interesting polls. Um, these were telephone polls that were done for Reader's Digest, of all things, in uh, the spring of 2006, spring, summer of 2006. And what you find in these polls is that middle-aged Iranians are actually more pro-American than the young generation. Uh, younger Iranians uh, aged sort of 19 through 30, and this is the majority of people in the country, 70% of Iranians are under the age of 30, uh, where they were asked who their favorite foreign leader was, and the vast majority said Vladimir Putin. So, you know, you get, you get certain people who will say they like George Bush and say, oh, bomb Iran, please, you know, come and do regime change here. But those are very much the kind of people that, that you mentioned. Uh, and uh, I think your average Iranian wants a prosperous country, wants the economy to improve, wants jobs uh, for, for the kids, uh, and they want Iran to stand tall and be respected in the world. And they, had, they see Vladimir Putin now restoring you know, Russia's role in the world. And, and a lot of people also, as you know, admire not the, the, the last Shah of Iran, but his father, Reza Shah, remains enormously popular. popular. This was a guy who came from the military. He was a Russian-trained uh, officer who uh, essentially staged a coup and took over Iran in uh, 1925. Uh, and so they're looking for a kind of modernizing military strongman a la Reza Shah or Kamal Ataturk. This is the model that most Iranians would like. Um, would they also like some more freedom? Do they also like American music and American fashions? Yeah, a lot of people do. But this is globalized now. It's not just American. It's really, it's really a globalized youth culture, which, which appeals to, to young Iranians. Um, one thing that I uh, always wondered is about the associations that are always being made between like uh, Iranian government and Al Qaeda. Uh, because I mean, for for us, for everybody who knows a little bit about like the roots of Al Qaeda and like what their ideology. So the roots of Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. I don't. Know. Al Qaeda. Yeah. Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Al Qaeda, actually. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> and it's hard for me to pronounce the yeah. English version of this. Of the Arabic so, word. <laughs> yeah, Say it in Arabic word. then. <laughs> yeah, so, um, because uh, I mean, ideologically, strategically, for from every point of view that. Uh, uh, we, I can see they, they at least up until two years ago that uh, things were more, you know, um, balanced. They were really, you couldn't imagine like them, like I couldn't imagine them going together, like uh, collaborating, but they were associations being made all the time by the, yeah. is it, was it intentional? Was it that they knew and they didn't want to ex to see that, or it was that it just didn't wasn't they weren't aware of this? Uh, like yeah, there there have been tactical links between Iran and Al Qaeda for a long time, going back to uh, the early 1990s when uh, Al Qaeda, when Osama bin Laden was in Sudan, and Iran had very good relations with with Sudan at that time. <clears throat> I mean, you know, rogues stick together. These were tactical alliances. Uh, they were also a form of insurance because Iran didn't want Al Qaeda attacking Iranian targets. Uh, so they shared information. Uh, the 9/11 Commission actually has, which I cite in the book, has a very good discussion of what those links were. Uh, they were such that that members of Al Qaeda actually went through uh, Iran back and forth to Afghanistan between 9/11. Some of the muscle men, the hijackers. But there is no evidence that Iran had any forewarning about 9/11. Uh, and no evidence that Iran played any, any role in it whatsoever. Um, my sense of Iran and Iranian officials is that, you know, Iran would be happy to turn over the Al-Qaeda people that it has uh, on a dime if it, were, were, if it was worth it to them. You know, but the Bush administration has never made it worth their while to, to discard this very, very powerful card in Iran's hand. So they'll play it. And they'll support groups like Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is also uh, a Sunni group, or Hamas, which is also a Sunni group, uh, because it's, it's to their advantage. This is how Iran exerts its power in, in the region. It's through Arab proxies. Iran is willing to fight to the last Arab 
They don't care how many Arabs commit suicide, you know, in support of whatever cause. But you don't see Iranians do it, do you? It's always, you know, it's always the poor Arabs who they've hoodwinked into, into doing this. Uh, one other thing is that there were tremendous jokes. You probably know about all the jokes after 9-11 about wh- how, why Iran could not do 9-11. You know, that, uh, oh, they would be late. Somebody would have to ask his mother's permission. You know, I mean, I, when I went there in December of 2001, there were so many, they were fabulous jokes about how Iran couldn't have done such a thing, you know. Um, but anyway, you know better. One question. First of all, thank you for your refreshing discussion. Um, one, it has been often observed that Iranians suffer from an identity crisis, a Persian identity on one side and religion on the other. Could you elaborate to your understanding how this plays in the whole scheme of things now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the Islamic Republic of Iran is you know, a contradiction in terms in a, in a lot of ways. Um, I've never done a, a you know, this is, this is just pure re- repertorial seat of the pants. I would say 20%, maybe 30% of the Iranian population is extremely devout, really devout Shia Muslims. And, you know, I've been there during Ashura, for example, which is the high point for, for Shia. This is the, uh, this commemorates the death of, of the Imam Hussein, uh, the grandson of the Prophet in Iraq, betrayed by the evil Iraqis. Uh, and it's it's a it's a real high point in, in in the Shia faith and for Iran in particular, and you know people really come out for Ashura. It's a it's a national holiday, and and you see how devout many people really are. They they beat their breasts and they lament and they watch plays of the death of Hussein and cry. And it, you know it doesn't seem it seems real to me, but it's the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's being forced down people's throats. So the the when I first went to Iran in 1996, I had lived in Egypt in the 1980s, and I was doing a story about the status of women in the Muslim world. So I went first to Cairo, because I'd lived there and I knew a lot of people, and, and then I went to Tehran, and it was very strange. In Cairo, it seemed that, um, no, let me start. In Tehran, most of the people I met were very pro-American. Um, most of them uh, seemed very secular. I didn't meet a single person, practically, who, who prayed. And a lot of the people I met drank alcohol. And wherever I went, I was being offered alcohol, which is, you know, illegal. And then I went to Cairo, and everybody hated the United States. Everybody was in the streets praying five times a day. And even my old friends had given up alcohol, and half my women friends were wearing a scarf. So, you know, when you try to force things down people's throats, they rebel. And certainly the young people... Uh, do not seem, most of them, many of them, terribly devout. Um, I think it's, it's and, and you go to Qum, you know, and the clerics there, the majority of clerics don't support the Islamic Republic of Iran. They think it was a terrific mistake to try to, uh, first of all, they don't, they don't accept the idea that a cleric can be the supreme leader of the country. They think this, this is sacrilege, that in the, in the absence of the, the Mahdi, the Imam, the 12th Imam who is, the Shiite Messiah who's supposed to come back, you know, on Judgment Day, that, that no cleric can pretend to supreme knowledge and that this is really sacrilege. And they also understand that uh, this has made religion unpopular in Iran. The clerics, they're called mullahs. Sometimes they have to change their clothes so that they can get a taxi to stop for them on the street. People spit at them. People laugh at them uh, because they feel that they've had an unfair advantage. And, you know, there are many more clerics now in Iran than there were at the time of the revolution. They created whole categories like Friday prayer leaders, which never existed before. There were no Friday pra- public Friday prayers where public sermons were delivered in, in Iran. The, it was a much more private thing. And, uh, and so they've institutionalized Islam in a way that has made it extremely unpopular with a, with a lot of people. Um, if Iranians could vote freely, I think they would get rid of the Islamic Republic. You know, maybe they would keep an advisory board of some sort. They would keep some clerics there for, you know, to, to examine legislation and make sure it had Islamic content or something like that. But they certainly would, they would have an elected president and parliament, and that would be it. One other question I had uh, relates to the role that Russia plays in the area. And I don't mean that in the sense that they are anti-American, but they have their own policies, mm-hmm. their own agenda, and it has nothing to do with international politics. Could you elaborate on that one, please, as well? 
Yeah, the Russians and the Iranians have a very interesting uh, relationship. Um, the Russians are very grateful to Iran that it didn't foment problems for the Russians in Central Asia and in the Caucasus after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Iran, as I pointed out, is very good at supporting militant groups, and it has all these proxies in the Arab world, but it's been very careful not to annoy the Russians. No support for the Chechens, you know, none of this, uh, and, and certainly not in Central Asia. Um, in fact, I mean, its best relations in the region are with Armenia, which is a Christian country. I always find this quite, quite interesting. So the Russians are aware of what Iran could do, and so they're careful. That's why they've been careful about sanctions. The Russians also have lucrative uh, economic relationship. They sell weapons to Iran. They're their number one supplier of arms. And they have been, at least until recently, building a nuclear reactor for the Iranians in uh, Bushir, the one that the Germans started that was uh, shut down after the revolution and the Russians resumed. Uh, the Russians want to be Iran's good friend. They're also, I think, trying in some way to influence the Iranians. They would like to be the ones who solve the nuclear question. They've proposed uh, enriching uranium for Iranian reactors in Russia. And Iran has not accepted the proposal, but Vladimir Putin went there just recently, and he was received by the supreme leader himself, which I thought was quite extraordinary. So, you know, they're trying. and. And of course, the Iranians want to be seen as having friends and not being isolated. I think that's why Khamenei saw, saw Putin. So there's a, there's a game being played here. Um, whether it will ultimately help solve the crisis or not, I don't know. But certainly, the Russians are not going to do things just to please the United States. That is for sure. Uh, thank you for the uh, realistic portrait of recent events in Iran. I have a question that you mentioned that the US has lost many opportunities for negotiation with Iran. I want to ask, uh, what's your idea that if those negotiations had gone through, what has happened to democracy, mm -hmm. freedom, justice in Iran, considering some historical events like uh, the coup against Mossadegh, uh, yeah. support of even Carter from uh, Shah, and you know, support of U.S. from Paris Musharraf in Pakistan that coups I, I understand your point. I know where you're going. Yeah. You know, what do you think you're wishing? And ref, you know, yeah. I, I am a big supporter of human rights for Iranians. I think, unfortunately, the way that Bush has gone about it has, has made Iran more repressive, as we see, much more repressive now than it was some years ago. Uh, in, during my career as a journalist, I, was a, I lived in the Soviet Union as a student, and I was a reporter in China in the early 1980s. And to my mind, there's only one model that works with these regimes, and that is that the United States has relations with them, puts an embassy there, floods the country with Americans, tries to bring as many of them as possible to the United States, you know, has detente, because then the regime relaxes its guard a little bit when you don't have that hostility, and over time, the human rights situation begins to improve. Obviously, it's not perfect. You know, if the U.S. could overthrow the government in Iran tomorrow, and do it without millions of people, thousands of people dying, that would be just fine. But it's, it, it can't. It simply can't. You know that, and I know that. So the only model I know for regime change, or at least re regime amelioration, that works is some kind of detente, you know, forum for negotiations. We had arms control talks uh, with, with the Russians. We recognized China. and. You know, I would argue that the life uh, of, of the average Russian or Chinese has improved enormously um, because of that, certainly in economic terms and even in terms of having some more personal space. When Hatami was president, you already saw some relaxation of tensions. And had the U.S. accepted those offers back when Hatami was president, I think it would have strengthened him. It's possible that Ahmadinejad never would have been elected president. What happened after that overture was rejected was that the Iranian neoconservatives began their uh, march to power. They, uh, they won municipal elections, then they disqualified all the reformers in parliamentary elections, uh, they, uh, and then they, uh, they won in the presidential elections as well. And the argument they used was, you stupid reformers, you know, you thought you could improve relations with the United States, what did you get? Watch us, we'll be tough and we'll make them respect us, and then they'll come to the negotiating table. And if you look at U.S. policy, frankly, in terms of Bush, he actually has made concessions, not you know, too little too late in terms of attracting the Iranians, but he's made concessions over time. And so Ahmadinejad can argue, really, that his policies are, are working. Uh, 
And again, human rights, you know, my, my good friend Hala Fandiari, who heads the acknowledgments in this book, was, was thrown in the clinker. Why? The Bush administration appropriated money, called for Congress to appropriate money for democracy promotion, and Iran decided, well, this is a good excuse to throw uh, even Iranian Americans in jail. So I just don't think that, that there's any other way. I wish there were. I think my sense of the Iranian people is that they don't want another revolution. They don't want a U.S. military attack. They would like change, but they'd like it to happen peacefully. And if it takes a little longer, well, well, so be it. But at least without so many more lives being lost. Yes, I have, uh, I have a comment and a couple of questions. Uh, my com actually not comment, a, a point of clarification. Uh, you pointed out during your uh, talk that Hamas, was another client of Iran. I was wondering whether you can clarify what you mean by, by client. Iran. They they get a lot of money from them. I mean, I don't think this is a this is a marriage of convenience. There's no great love between Hamas, which is Sunni fundamentalist, uh, and the Iranian regime. But um, it's a card to play, and it shows that Iran is uh, supporting the Palestinians, uh, although it's not doing much for Mahmoud Abbas, but that Iran is supporting the, the maximalist demands of, of the Palestinians. It gets them a lot of street credibility uh, with you know, uh, Arabs, Arab populations. Uh, and it's, it's a card to play against Israel and against the United States. If Israel were to attack Iran, attack its nuclear program, Iran would retaliate through Hamas and Hezbollah. That's how it would retaliate. Um, and there, there you know, reliable reports that Hamas members have gone to Iran for military training, and certainly there has been, there has been financial support as well. Uh, Hezbollah is a little closer because it's a Shia, it's a, a Shia group, and uh, there's more of a, an affinity, I think, between Iran and, and Hezbollah than there is between Iran and Hamas, but I call it a client or a proxy because they get support, a lot of support from Iran. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate your clarification, but by the same token, I was wondering whether you can refer to Israel or Egypt as American clients. Absolutely, especially Israel. Although sometimes I think the United States is Israel's clients, so you can decide. <laughs> That's off the record. <laughs> Nothing's off the record, is it? Oh, dear. Well, to my Israeli friends, I apologize. Uh, but now here is... is uh, um, the first one is that during your uh, uh, trips to Iran and your interviews, whether you had any chance to meet and uh, talk to Iranian feminists. Oh, and, yes. And, and if you did, yeah. because you've done research on, on uh, women and gender, and, and, and whether you found their uh, <coughs> views any different than male uh, political figures. <laughs> of course. I mean, although I would still say, you know, women obviously have lost a lot since the, the revolution uh, in terms of the rights that they had under the Shah. Um, under the Shah, I believe the age, legal age of marriage was 18 for women. And when Khomeini came in, he lowered it to nine, which is what it says in the Quran. Then through the efforts of, of people like Shireen Abadi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, it's been pushed back up to 13. But, you know, it's still not exactly ideal. Um, no, clearly there have been many problems for women, but there is also a very strong Islamic fund fundamentalist movement in the country. One of the women I interviewed was a woman named Shakla Sherkat, who runs a, a magazine, Zenon, yeah, that you must be familiar with, and uh, uh, has done a lot, I think, to advance women's rights in the country. And there was one positive effect. Um, because women, lower middle class women, middle class women came out on the streets to demonstrate during the revolution, uh, Khomeini let them keep the right to vote, you know, which he had once opposed, but women kept the right to vote. Uh, and even the, the, re the requirement that women wear uh, the veil, wear the hijab, has actually worked in favor of a lot of women because uh, middle class and lower middle class Iranian women who were reluctant to go to university uh, under the Shah because the, they had to you know, wear mini skirts in those days, it was forbidden to, to wear this stuff, started going, and now 60% of the university students are women. So uh, I, the women I have met have been incredible. I mean, from all walks of life, these are uh, women who do practically every uh, profession. They're really tough. 
they hold the family together. Um, and uh, I think that something has been unleashed that will eventually also change the society. It's just, it has to be. Uh, they can't keep them down. Well, this has been a great example of a journalist who has uh, brought very good reporting and analysis and uh, is wonderfully articulate on a very complex topic. So please, we're at the end of our time. We would like to give you an opportunity to um, buy books and have them signed by Barbara. But, but uh, in the meantime, uh, join me in thanking her for being here tonight. <clears throat> group and we hope to see you again at one of our forums.